If you clicked on this video, you're either a subscriber, thank you for subscribing, or your low end is shit in your mixes and today we're going to fix it. Low end is one of the hardest things to get right in mixes and it's certainly one of the hardest things to get to translate to other systems. The car, your Bluetooth speaker, your fancy Beats headphones, it can be a real struggle. So today I'm gonna to walk you through everything that I do that has transformed my low end in my mixes and let me go from the super inconsistent, floppy, sometimes great, sometimes horrible low end to where every single mix is thick and powerful, hits hard and sounds great in every single system. So the first thing that we need to talk about is your mindset, your mental approach to mixing. Now the one thing that I see tons of people get wrong, I certainly got this wrong for a very, very long time, is thinking that low end was the most important part in the mix, focusing too much on the low end. Now obviously low end is important. We all want our songs to hit hard, be thick and full, but low end is not the most important thing in the mix. And usually focusing too much on the low end means that our low end actually sucks worse than if we focus on the things that actually matter in the mix, like the mid range. Now I did a whole mix tutorial called Magic is in the mid range. I'll put a link in the description below. When you're done with this video, please go watch that video because aside from the things that I'm talking about in this video, if you do the things in that mix tutorial, your low end will drastically improve. So when I'm mixing, low end is the very last thing that I do in a mix. I focus on all the rest of the frequency points before I focus on like 100 hertz and below. Because if from 100 hertz up isn't right, 100 hertz and below will never be right. The next thing that is really, really easy to do, something that I got wrong for many years and something that I see tons of people get wrong, is having too much low end in your mixes. Too much low end usually makes the low end sound worse. So if you want that 808 to crush and just hit you in your gut when you're in the car, the answer is almost never to just turn the low end up. That's not how you get the best low end. There's always a limit to how much low end you can put into a mix, and it's different based on the elements, the kicks and the bass and the synthesizers in the mix, in the song, and it's also different based on the song itself and the arrangement. There's a lot of things that go into this, but there's always a limit. And so what the very best sounding mixers are doing, the best mixes with the best low end, they are just really, really good at pushing all the way up to the very, very limit of what is possible for that song and for the elements in that mix. But it's really, really easy to push it past that limit and then your low end falls apart and doesn't sound good, tight, and powerful anymore. So chances are if you're struggling with the low end in your mixes, you're probably putting too much low end in there. The next thing that I got wrong forever and I see people still get wrong is having too many elements in the low end of the mix. Now when I say low end for the context of this video, I'm talking from 100 hertz down. Now if you have too many things happening below 100 hertz, it starts to get make things muddy and there's not room for something to just be nice and clear and focused in the low end. Now sometimes this is too many low things actually happening. Too many different synthesizers, like if you have a bass synthesizer and a bass bass guitar both happening at the same time, you really have to be careful about where you place those because if they're both hitting hard at 100 hertz or at 80 hertz or at 60 hertz, there's no way that's gonna sound solid because they're going to be competing. So if you can take your bass guitar and make it hit from 100 to 120 hertz and make your synthesizer hit from 40 to 80 or 90 hertz, that's gonna give you like a place for both of those and it's a lot more likely that your low end will be solid feeling when you do this. Now, in addition to too many elements happening in the low end below 100 hertz, something that's really common is for people to not high pass things enough. Now, this is a controversial topic. There are some people that think you shouldn't high pass anything. There are some people that think you should high pass every single track in your mix. I fall somewhere in the middle. If you look at a vocal track, it's really, really common for there to be a lot of 80 or 90 hertz information in a vocal, but this is not where the vocal lives. 
no vocal needs 80 hertz in order to sound good. I mean, unless you're Barry White or something. <laughs> now, more than likely what this is, is room noise or rumble from the microphone. The singer's shifting around on their feet and that vibration is transferring through your microphone stand and giving rumble, putting rumble in the vocal mic. Now, while this might not be all that audible when you're just listening to the vocal, you take a hundred tracks in a production and there's a little bit of this rumble and this this frequency that doesn't need to be there, that doesn't add anything to the mix or to the instrument itself. And this can create a lot of mud and a, a huge lack of definition in the low end of your mixes. So I don't think that you need to high pass everything. Like for instance, on electric guitars, there's a lot of times when I pull up an electric guitar and I look at it, there's literally nothing below 100 hertz there. You can see it in the EQ. So there's not really any reason to high pass stuff like that because when you high pass or EQ things unnecessarily, you can make things sound worse. Now I also high pass my mix bus and I do it sometimes higher than you might think. It's very common for me to high pass my mix bus, my kick drums, my synthesizers, and my bass guitars, sometimes up to 35 and 40 hertz depending on the context. Because sometimes all of that 20 and 30 hertz makes the low end sound loose and flabby. Which leads me into my next point, is people misunderstanding frequency points and where they actually need to be. This is kind of a two-part thing. One, most people just think that the lower frequencies you go, the lower you boost, the thicker your mix is, and this is not necessarily true. Firstly, there are almost no elements that you could ever put in a mix in any genre that 20 hertz is super important, certainly not below 20 hertz. And not only are you dealing with the frequencies that sound good for the elements that you're mixing, for the kick or the synthesizer or the bass, you're also dealing with the technical limitations of the speakers that you're listening on in your car, in your home stereo, in your earbuds. Every speaker has an ability, a different ability to reproduce those lowest frequencies. And almost none of them are good at reproducing producing 20 hertz. So chances are wherever you are focusing on your low end, whatever frequency, when you think of the low end of a kick drum and what frequency that is that you normally boost to, to get more low end, chances are if you push that up 10 or 20 hertz higher, you will actually have better results. Then the second part of people misunderstanding frequencies is a lot of people just think that if you boost 100 hertz on a bass guitar, that's always the good frequency, and this is not necessarily the case. Now every kick drum and every synthesizer and every bass guitar has a fundamental frequency. So it doesn't matter if it's an acoustic kick drum, a real kick drum that has a, had a microphone in front of it, or if it's an 808, or if it's a real bass guitar, or if it's a bass synth, or a sine wave, or it, all of this, this applies to all of it. Every single element that you would ever mix has a fundamental frequency. And in my opinion, the very best practice is to find that fundamental frequency and boost that if that's what you're after, if you want more low end. Because if your acoustic kick drum is hitting really good at 68 hertz, but you're trying to boost 40 hertz, you're losing power and you're losing solidity. It's really easy to boost like 40 hertz on a kick drum that hits at 68 hertz and all you get is a looser, flabbier sounding kick drum. Same thing goes for a bass guitar. You know, a bass guitar might be hitting really, really good at 90 or 100 hertz. That's a real common frequency range for most bass guitars to be thick at. That's their fundamental frequency. However, if you try to boost 40 and 50 hertz, chances are you're just making a thick, thicker, flabbier, looser sound, rather than getting more low end out of the instrument. So when you're mixing instruments and kick drums with lots of low end information, be sure to pay attention to, you can even do this with your eyes, be sure to pay attention to where the fundamental frequency is. Try to work with that fundamental frequency. If you need something a little bit lower, maybe go 10 or 20 hertz below that fundamental. But if you start boosting, you know, 20, 30, 40 hertz below where that fundamental is, chances are it will just create a looser sound, a, a flabbier low end, than if you just pay attention to where the fundamental is. Now, this is not the most sexy part, but acoustic treatment. Having your room acoustically treated to have great low end in your room is super important for the translation of the low end in your mixes. If you can't accurately hear what is happening 
below 100 hertz, then there's no way that you're gonna mix well below 100 hertz. So let's start at the basics. The very first thing that you should do in your room is have the first reflection points covered. You can Google acoustic treatment first reflection points and click on Google Images. You'll see a whole bunch of charts of how the sound bounces out of the speakers and where it goes. So the most important thing is that you cover these first reflection points with broadband absorption not foam. You need something that absorbs the full frequency spectrum. Now there's a, a lot of different companies that make panels like this, like GIK Acoustics, Music City Acoustics here in Nashville does a great job with their panels. You can build these panels out of Owens Corning 703 or out of 705 or like eight pound mineral wool. But the important thing is that you get broadband absorption, something that covers the full frequency spectrum and you get those first reflection points covered. If you have no acoustic treatment, this is the very first place you need to start, and that includes a ceiling cloud. A ceiling cloud is really important in this. Now, if you're someone who has all these first reflection points covered, this is where you need to get some measurement software, and you need to measure your room and see what it sounds like, see what it looks like, and you may find that you have a huge hole in your room at like 68 hertz. You might find that you have way too much 47 hertz in your room, and then you need to get into bass traps and start working out how to solve these problems in your room. I may need to do a whole video dedicated to doing just that. Now the next most important thing in my opinion is isolating your speakers, decoupling them from the room. So the low end in your speakers doesn't translate into your room and make your room vibrate and resonate. Now my favorite product for this is the ISO Acoustics Pucks. I have them on my speakers under my folk house here and they radically transformed how they sound. The low end got way more solid and way more clear and easy to hear when I put my speakers up on these ISO Acoustics Pucks. I'll put a link to those in the description below. Those links go to Sweetwater. Sweetwater is sponsoring this video and they sponsor all of these videos. Thank you so much to Sweetwater for sponsoring this video. I get all my gear from Sweetwater and have for, I mean like forever. I literally get all my stuff from Sweetwater. They have great customer service, super fast, like next day shipping, uh, free shipping on most things within the US. Can't recommend Sweetwater enough. Let's get back to these ISO acoustics pucks though. So what they do is they decouple your speaker so the vibration from your speaker can't transfer into your room and I, I really can't recommend them enough. It really transformed how my room sounded, especially if you are using concrete blocks like I am because there's no decoupling in concrete blocks. They, these speakers were coupling really hard actually. So getting those speakers decoupled from your room so your room doesn't vibrate and resonate as much in these low end frequencies will go a long ways to helping you hear better and more accurately what's happening in the low end of your mixes. Don't forget to check the links in the description for the magic is in the mid-range video and for everything else that I talked about. Do all of these things and it will drastically improve the low end in your mixes. I promise you. I don't make promises on this channel very often, but if you do all of these things, your low end will drastically improve. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Drop me a comment if this helped you or if you enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.